Good evening, everyone. Um, after two decades of threats to convert Hagia Sophia into a mosque, uh, the Turkish president, uh, Erdogan, finally took action uh, that so many believed was unimaginable. Uh, with first uh, prayer scheduled for this Friday, it's important for us to consider what Hagia Sophia, what the Hagia Sophia moment uh, means for the future of Christianity in Turkey and for our ecumenical patriarchate. Uh, this is why I've invited uh, members of our community, our clergy and lay leaders to this special briefing on Hagia Sophia and religious freedom. I would like uh, now to introduce to you our briefers. Uh, first is Dr. Elizabeth Podromo, uh, who is one of our community's uh, leading authorities on international religious freedom and a personal friend of mine and uh, a friend of this metropolis. Dr. Fodromo is currently a faculty member of the Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy at Tufts University and uh, co-president and World Council member of Religions for Peace. She has also served as vice chair of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. Dr. Fodromo, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Your Eminence. Uh, also with us is Dr. Aykan Erdemir, who is the Senior Director of the Turkey Program at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies and a former member of Turkish Parliament. Uh, both in his time in Parliament and outside of Parliament, Dr. Erdemir has been an outspoken advocate of minority rights and religious pluralism and freedom in Turkey. Uh, Dr. Erdemir, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Your Eminence. And uh, lastly, we have um, Andy Zemanidis, uh, somebody from our metropolis, uh, the executive director of the Hellenic American Leadership Council, or HALC. HALC has undertaken several public education and advocacy initiatives, many featuring doctors uh, Podromo and Erdemir, to call, act, uh, to call attention to the threats against religious freedom in Turkey. And he has presently uh, constructed a coalition with In Defense of Christians and the Armenian National Committee of America to hold Turkey accountable for the actions they have taken. Uh, welcome to you all. Uh, Andy, welcome. Thank you, Your Eminence. Uh, <clears throat> welcome, everyone. And I, I want to start with a few questions uh, for each of you and at the end leave time for some questions from our, our clergy and lay leaders. Um, Again, for those who have questions, um, please hold on till the end of the briefing and uh, submit your question through the chat feature of our Zoom. Um, let's start with Dr. Uh, Prodromu. Um, despite the great deal of media attention uh, that Hagia Sophia has received in the last few weeks, uh, we're discovering how little people actually know about the history of Hagia Sophia. Um, you would think more people would know about this great um, uh, structure, I mean, once a church, then a mosque, then a museum. Uh, can you give our audience kind of five basic facts that they should uh, know uh, or use to make sure everyone understands the significance of Hagia Sophia when they speak to people about Hagia Sophia? Of course, I'll try to... Um... I'll try to consolidate uh, 2,000 years of history, actually 1,500 years of history in five minutes. So thank you, Your Eminence, for always giving me the easy things. Um, so I, let me say uh, what Hagia Sophia means for those who created it and then those who inherited it historically. Uh, Hagia Sophia, for those who don't know, um, and we hear Hagia Sophia a lot, um, Hagia Sophia was uh, commissioned by the Byzantine Emperor Justinian I, uh, to be built uh, during the five-year interval between 532 and 537 AD. Um, so it was built this magnificent, magnificent structure, Cathedral of the Holy Wisdom, an architectural wonder. Um, it was the equivalent of a Byzantine uh, massive public wor works project uh, for Christendom's Queen of Cities, as uh, Constantinople was known at the time. At that time in the, um, in the sixth century, uh, the, the, co the population of Constantinople was between uh, 750,000 to, to 1 million. Um, and the, um, the Church of the Holy Wisdom was named for the Cathedral of uh, the Holy Wisdom for the second person of Christ. 
And that's important because the architectural marvel that is Hagia Sophia um, was reflected in this notion of the holy wisdom, a meeting place between the, terrestri the terrestrial and the celest celestial, um, the earth and the heavens. Um, and it was meant to be an architectural representation and a sacred space, a church, um, that reflected the uh, perfect symphony and balance between the bounded and the unbounded. So for the theologians amongst you, we can see the idea of Christ, okay, both bounded and un unbounded. Um, and Hagia Sophia served as the see of the ecumenical patriarchate uh, until the uh, 15th century, until the fall of Constantinople in 1453, when the city was conquered by Muhammad II, also known as um, Mehmet II, the conqueror. Um, and at that time, uh, the, the great church of the Holy Wisdom was converted into a mosque. And as for Christians and of all Christendom at, ta at the time, the significance of that structure as a sacred space had significance also when it was converted to a mosque. Uh, the sayings of Islam's prophet Muhammad said that whoever conquered Constantinople, Constantinia, would go straight to heaven. So the conversion of the mosque signified the conquest of Constantinople, the church signified the conquest of Constantinople. Um, and so up until uh, the founding of the Turkish Republic, there was great cosmological significance, theological significance, first for Christians and then for, for Muslims uh, in, in diff very different ways, but nonetheless uh, important. Uh, what it means for the world today, in 1985, Hagia Sophia was designated by UNESCO, the UN Educational, Scientific and Cultural Organization, as a World Heritage Site. And protection as a World Heritage Site means that a site has outstanding value for all humanity, and that it's a site and a space that should be preserved and protected for future generations, therefore recognizing the universal value of, of a World Heritage Site. And as UNESCO says, Hagia Sophia is a, um, a unique testimony to interactions between Europe and Asia over the century, a powerful symbol for dialogue necessary to protect and transmit the outstanding universal value of the structure. What it means, uh, what it meant for the Turkish state makers, and in particular, the the father of modern Turkey uh, was uh, in 1934 signified when Mustafa Kemal Ataturk converted the mo church mosque into, first church, then mosque, into a museum. And that signified the conquest of Kemalist understanding of secularism over religion, certainly over Islam, which he saw as responsible for Ottoman decline, and certainly dominance over uh, uh, Christians and other small populations. What it means for Erdogan today, a new kind of cosmological significance, the reconquest of a secular space, and the reemergence of a long Islamic tradition. And then finally, um, Hagia Sophia as a, a geopolitical pr uh, project. That's the fifth point. Uh, it's impossible to understand this decision without recognizing how it is that Erdogan and, and the current Turkish government understand Hagia Sophia as part of a, an expansionist, revisionist geopolitical project from, as he has said, from Baghdad uh, to Sarajevo, from Central Asia to, to Spain. And uh, to sum it up, as Erdogan said today, Hagia Sophia tomorrow, Al-Aqsa Mosque in Jerusalem. Uh, uh, Dr. Prodromo, thank you, Elizabeth, for that. I, I, I knew you could get all of that history, 1,500 years in less than five minutes. So thank you. I, I'm, I, I'm so, we have no air conditioning anyway, so that was maybe even warmer than I already was, but thank you, Your Eminence. Okay. Okay. Well, <clears throat> why don't we, um, I think most of our people are you know, we're, we're limited to our own experience, right? To our own context. Um, Dr. Erdemir, can you kind of take us inside Turkey and, and help us understand um, from a different perspective, from someone who actually is from Turkey, you know, why and why this has happened now? Um, what is, what the president, uh, President Erdogan is thinking and, and really, what, is, what has been the reaction inside of Turkey? Because I mean, maybe that's not coming out in the news here. Um, so if you can help us understand 
the, the response and the Turkish uh, perspective uh, of, of this uh, conversion or reconversion of Hagia Sophia into a mosque? Uh, sure. Uh, I think it's important to start with mm -hmm. the idea that converting Hagia Sophia predates Erdogan. So this has been a long time dream of Turkey's Islamists as well as ultra-nationalists. Uh, it even predates Erdogan's mentor, Nejmettin Erbakan, who was the first leader of formally the first Islamist party in Turkey back in 1969. So although political Islam in Turkey goes back to only 1969, Islamism as a movement predates that. And uh, from 40s, 50s on, we see a strong uh, Islamist trend that centers around the idea of reconverting Hagia Sophia. Now, uh, with one dis uh, difference, uh, when Erdogan, parted his ways in 2001 with the mothership, that is with Turkey's mainstream Islamist party, and set up his Justice and Development Party, the AKP. He stopped repeating his desire to convert Hagia Sophia. So just to give you a concrete example, Back in 1994, when Erdogan was the mayor of Istanbul from that Islamist party, and there have been a number of successive Islamist parties, uh, but it's all one main tradition, he was on the record wanting to convert Hagia Sophia. But fast forward to 2001, 2002, when Erdogan's party comes to power with the November 2002 elections, you no longer hear any of that. And the first time Erdogan repeated that old message, his desire to convert Hagia Sophia, was March 2019. So this is very important to understand. You know, why now? And why did he wait almost 18 years without saying a word? The second part of the question is what we call dissimulation. This is a typical Islamist strategy. Uh, which people like me, both as academics, advocates, and then as politicians, uh, were trying to warn the Turkish public about. You know, we told people, we warned Turkish citizens that Erdogan was dissimulating, that he was not a reformed Democrat, that he was arguing to be, but he was still the Islamist. He was simply trying to dupe Turkish voters as well as Turkey's NATO allies. And so after almost 18 years as a wolf in sheepskin, Erdogan shows his real face. But then there's another question. Why wait until March 2019? And the answer I have for you is a paradoxical one. And my take home message for this first part is, this is Erdogan at his weakest, and this is also Erdogan at his strongest. And that paradoxical combination explains why Hagia Sophia and why now. Let me try to uh, lay out the facts. This is Erdogan at his weakest because when we go back to March 2019, we see that Erdogan, for the first time in over two decades, voiced his desire to convert Hagia Sophia only days before a, a challenging municipal election uh, for which the polls predicted that Erdogan would lose Istanbul. Now, Istanbul is Erdogan's cash cow and where he built himself and his new movement. So Istanbul is really the center of his neo-Islamist vision. So the last thing he wanted was to lose Istanbul. So he thought, just pitching in this radical idea, would solidify his voter base and help him win Istanbul again. He was mistaken, he lost Istanbul. And those of you who follow the elections closely might remember that Erdogan used all the cards up his sleeve. He uh, alleged that the opposition's mayor, mayoral candidate was Pontian. He insinuated that he was Greek Orthodox, that he was Christian. 
but it didn't work out. So neither Hagia Sophia nor an anti-Christian, anti-Greek campaign helped him win elections. Even when he annulled the elections and ran it again, he lost with a larger margin. So that's March 2019. So that is what I argue Erdogan at his weakest. But why now? Because things have gone downhill since the municipal elections of March 2019 and its rerun in June 2019. Uh, Turkey's economy was bankrupt before the COVID-19 crisis and Erdogan's mismanagement of the public health crisis uh, meant an even greater economic crisis, massive unemployment, uh, and Erdogan losing support, according to polls, even among his core voters. So at this point, he has the lowest vote uh, share of votes since his rise to power in 2002. Hence my argument that this is Erdogan at his weakest and a desperate Erdogan using Hagia Sophia to gain legitimacy, to create rally around the flag effect, and to mobilize both the Islamist and the ultra-nationalist voters. But at the same time, keep in mind that this wouldn't have been possible if it weren't for Erdogan at his strongest. And what I mean by that is, although he lacks legitimacy, although he lacks popular support to an unprecedented level, he has consolidated power also to an unprecedented level. I would argue that he has more power than the founding father of Turkey, Mustafa Kemal Atatürk, who ruled as you know, a one-man ruler, who ruled as part of a single-party regime, as part of his you know, radical modernizing reforms. Today, Erdogan has amassed executive, legislative, judicial powers. He can pretty much run the country by issuing decrees uh, as he wills, you know, sometimes he legislates one thing in the morning and changes it in the afternoon. So he has absolute say as to how to steer Turkey. There is no checks and balances. There is no separation of powers and no pushback from anyone. And that's what we have seen with Hagia Sophia. Erdogan not only declared again that he would do it, he did it very quickly. Turkey's opposition was unable to push back. Turkey's academia, Turkey's media, Turkey's NGOs. There were a few voices here and there, but they were immediately silenced, smeared, accused of treason, being fifth columns, being terrorists. So hence uh, my argument, Erdogan could do this precisely because although he's no longer legitimate or popular, he has enormous power. So. This, I think, in a nutshell, explains how we came here. And one final footnote, also keep in mind that Erdogan knows that his story is coming to an end. You know, Turkey is on the brink of bankruptcy. Uh, he no longer has a success story to sell. And he is already thinking about his legacy. You know, what will be the legacy of Islamist rule after, you know, almost two decades or maybe a little more? Uh, because he has not much to show in other domains. You know, Turkey's democracy is in shambles, economy is in shambles, but he has Hagia Sophia to show. You know, this is one big Islamist legacy that his loyal followers can cherish for decades to come. So I think that's also something to keep in mind. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Demir, for that. Um, uh, and the, uh, let me turn to you now. The, um, the decision uh, has led a lot of officials, many officials from the U.S. and uh, around the world to speak out. Um, can you just, again, recap, uh, just like uh, Elizabeth and I kind of did, um, can you tell us what, has, have, what have been the reactions uh, by world leaders um, and how consequential are they? So uh, I'll go a couple weeks back when the original court decision was supposed to come in and they delayed it. Uh, that week there were some positive, hopeful uh, declarations by Ambassador Brownback, the Trump administration's uh, ambassador for international religious freedom, and then Secretary Pompeo, who both declared that, you know, we expect 
Turkey to keep this a museum. Now, after the decision, I think that that type of stance early on gave us hope. After the decision, it couldn't be more disappointing uh, what's coming out uh, of the administration, which is nothing. Uh, literally a day after the decision or two days, uh, President Trump had a, a call with President Erdogan. The readout showed not even a mention of Hagia Sophia, not even a mention of uh, religious freedom in Turkey. Secretary Pompeo stood up at the, uh, at the lectern and said, we've said all we've got to say. Uh, and from the information I have, he's not even granting the archdiocese an audience until late August, which is way after, uh, way after the first prayers. And this is not even a partisan issue. If, if you look at Chairman Jim Risch, a Republican chair of the Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, you look at Tom Tillis, uh, Jim Lankford. If you look at uh, some of the president's top advisors in the, in the evangelical community, uh, one Johnny Moore, who served like or serves now on the same commission that Elizabeth served in his writing, has written two or three op-eds with uh, Icon's wife, better half, Dr. Tubai Erdemir. And he's one of five inner circle evangelical advisors. And he's calling against uh, what's happening in Hagia Sophia. In defense of Christians, also very influential in this administration, being very open about the Hagia Sophia issue. So there is, there is something weird going on in Washington. I, I recommend that everybody read Icon's writings about a whole host of issues. It's not only Hagia Sophia, it's Hawk Bank, uh, it's the Michael Flynn situation, but it's disappointing what's coming out. There's a lot of, a lot of momentum in Congress to hold Turkey accountable here. And frankly, it may take Congress stepping forward. Today, for example, another issue, something that the administration also uh, dragged its feet on, when, uh, when Turkey bought Russian S-400s, the administration still wanted to give them F-35s. Congress said no, and today, after multiple pieces of legislation, the Air Force took possession of those F-35s again. I think Congress is gonna have to do some, something on that front. And internationally, the person I have to tip my hat to is Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis. Um, he has made this an issue at the whole European uh, Union, uh, and, and not in a chauvinistic or classic civilizations way. Uh, but you see, uh, Greece has a lot of issues, and we, I guess we can get into them later, but they keep putting Hagia Sophia at at the top of it, and Foreign Minister Vendia said that uh, they're prepared in August to, to present crippling sanctions uh, if this continues. Um, thank you, Andy. Uh, Elizabeth, um, Andy mentioned writings. Um, there have been a lot of people writing uh, and speaking, um, and you've been quite uh, prolific in your writings. Uh, about Hagia Sophia in Turkey, but more recent, most recently, you um, wrote an article um, that laid out the greater significance of Hagia Sophia's the decision for Hagia Sophia, titled "Turkey's Cultural Heritage Kujo." Um, can you lay out for us your argument and what do these actions on Christian cultural heritage mean uh, for Turkey's religious minorities? Sure. Um, so the article that I wrote it was about a month ago. Um, and it's called Turkey's Cultural Heritage Cudgel. And a cudgel is a, it's a club. It's something, a tool that you use to beat um, uh, an enemy into submission. And the basic argument of that article is that uh, the Turkish state, uh, since the foundation, the establishment of modern Turkey, has used cultural heritage policy, quite systematic and all-encompassing cultural heritage policy um, to, uh, as a club, to beat uh, it's small minority populations, in particular Christian minorities, but also what are called non-conforming Muslims, for example, Alawites, um, into submission. And um, I, I uh, offer a, a series of um, 
facts to support that claim. And I come back here to, um, to Icon's earlier point about sort of dissimulation, uh, takia, right, uh, I think is the, the term. Um, you know, and I would say that that's the difference between the text and the subtext when it comes to what's happened just now with Hagia Sophia. And the article, I, uh, my argument is that if people have been paying attention, they would have seen the subtext, uh, certainly since the election of this government in Turkey, but before that, uh, was leading uh, in some ways inexorably towards this moment. And I, I, I'll give a couple of examples to sort of illustrate the point. Um, the two major institutions in Turkey that manage cultural and religious heritage are the Directorate General of Foundations and the Ministry of Culture and Tourism. And just a parenthesis, last year, more people visited, about 3.6, 3.7 million people visited Hagia Sophia than any other um, cultural heritage site in Turkey. Um, but I would say that um, Turkey has demonstrated through those ministries a kind of what I call a, an Hagia Sophia fetish. And what do I mean by that? That um, over the last several years, there's the small Hagia Sophia in Istanbul, the mosque, Kuchuk uh, Hagia Sophia, which is a functioning mosque. But then there are three other crucial Hagia Sophias, which were churches, then converted to mosques, and then museums, that, which have been reactivated into mosques in preparation for this moment. There's the one in, in Trabzon, Trabzonda. Mm -hmm. There's the one in Adrianople, Edirne. And then there's the one in Iznik, Nicaea, uh, where two of the ecumenical councils took place. And so there's been a systematic process of reactivating those Hagia Sophias into mosques as preparation for this moment. And that's the subtext. The other crucial part of that subtext was a decision that went completely unnoticed in the inter international community in November of 2019, which is when the same court in Turkey that rendered the decision on Hagia Sophia um, made a decision that the beautiful Hora church, um, which had been converted as well to uh, a mosque and then a museum, would be now reactivated as a, a mosque. And as everyone knows, the, that's probably the second most visited uh, site in Tur Turkey for uh, for uh, tourists and also for Turkish citizens. And it contains some of the most fantastic um, Byzantine mosaics from the so-called Paleologan Renaissance period. So the subtext here, um, you know, has been that this was in the offing. There were other signs as well. Um, in 2012, for example, um, there were prayers in the outside on the first day of Ramadan, the permission for Islamic prayers uh, in the outer yard of the big Hagia Sophia, the cathedral. Um, there was in 2013, uh, more prayers uh, during Ramadan. Then there was the appointment by the Director General of Religious Affairs of a permanent Imam for Hagia Sophia. And then there was Erdogan's uh, last year on May 29th, um, I believe it was May 29th, statement about um, you know the importance of Hagia Sophia as a, a location dedicated to the souls of all who left us. Uh, this is our inheritance, he said, especially Istanbul's conqueror. So the, the, the details matter, those kind of uh, phrases. So I would say that you know this should have been no surprise to anyone because there were there was ample evidence that this was going to happen. Um, and, and, and when we connect that in particular to Turkey's foreign policy, uh, a revisionist foreign policy, um, we, we see the idea of recreating a new Ottoman Empire. And Hagia Sophia as a mosque will be the center of that new Ottoman Empire. And before I forget one last footnote, it's no mistake because history is alive here. And we see whether for Christians or Muslims or for a, a world universal community, um, the activation of history and historical memory here, but also the possibility for communities to sustain themselves. The date of July 24th, and I can correct me if I'm wrong, but is no mistake. It's not, you know, Erdogan woke up one day and said, okay, let's do it on July 24th to hold the prayers. July 24th, and by the way, today is uh, July 20th, a black day. It's the day of the invasion of Cyprus and the occupation of Northern Cyprus since 1974. And what has happened there to religious sites 
for me, bodes very poorly for the prospects for, you know, respecting Hagia Sophia, maybe even as a shared space, which, which some have discussed. And I know Tuba is one of the people who, you know, talks in her writing about this. Um, but in uh, July 24th is the anniversary of the signing of the Treaty of Lausanne. And the Treaty of Lausanne ended the um, hostilities uh, of the First World War and established the bound for Turkey and the great powers and established the territorial boundaries of the current Turkish state. And President Erdogan has been quite clear that he considers the Treaty of Lausanne something that needs to be abrogated. And incidentally, the Treaty of Lausanne provided detailed provision for the protection of certainly the historic Christian minorities, Greek, Armenian, Syriac, or Assyrian, but also for uh, the country's other religious minorities. So history is being utilized um, along with this continuous subtext. And I think that's why we should not be surprised that this has happened. Well, um, Elizabeth, you mentioned that people have been paying attention, things have been happening uh, all for, for quite some time. Um, and so Dr. Uh, Erdemir, um, what should we be keeping our eye on now in terms of the treatment of religious minorities in Turkey, given the situation, the political, the economic, um, kind of fragile, it's, it, the, how fragile things are there. Um, you know, what should we be focusing on in terms of the treatment of religious minorities? Are there things that we should uh, notice um, that we're maybe missing because we're so far away? Um, I will limit my answer to two key issues. One is a short-term issue and the other one is kind of a more mid-term issue. And I think these are important to communicate, uh, especially since I'm addressing both the faith leadership and the lay leadership. I think it's important for you also to articulate this to multiple audiences in the US, especially because people miss it all the time. So one of the key risks about the conversion of Hagia Sophia is not just about the church, is not just about the ecumenical patriarchate, but it's also uh, to all the Christians and other religious minorities in Turkey through the language, the rhetoric that accompanies conversion. I think we need to push back against the conversion uh, while we also push back at least as strong against this rhetoric. And what I mean by that is, I'll give you some concrete examples and hopefully within this week, uh, I'll have an op-ed documenting all this with my better health tuba. Uh, and uh, the, the first concept that the Turkish government uses is the right of the sword. So they're arguing that Hagia Sophia's conversion stems from the right of the sword of Mehmet II. That is, and they also refer to this as, you know, the right of the conquest. And now I think it's very important to expose and shame the Turkish government for using such a language in year 2020. So this is not 1453, this is 2020. And uh, you can imagine what this does to the psyche of minority citizens of Turkey. Although the Turkish constitution is based on secularism and equal citizenship, this framing of the Hagia Sophia debate relegates them to, from citizenship to subjecthood and turns them into conquered um, almost subjects or, or minorities of the Sultan. And uh, you know this was very well articulated uh, by Archbishop Epidaphoros, you know, his uh, interview on BBC, uh, which is also on the Archdiocese's website, I think uh, it, it, it is a brilliant framing of the issue. So I would strongly recommend quoting him and sharing that BBC interview, which uh, Tuba and I have also made sure is in our upcoming op-ed as well. So that's one key issue to get across, that a NATO member state, a US treaty ally, 
you know, uh, a, a, a republic that claims to be based on and you know, con you know, con constitutional democracy is using a medieval language of conquest, right of the sword, and they even use the term uh, remnants of the sword to refer to the minorities, and which is a direct reference to the fact that the remaining few minorities in Turkey are the leftovers for various reasons from genocidal killings and pogroms. So the, I, I think it's very important for the US and the EU and NATO and other international bodies to make clear to the Turkish government that such a rhetoric, such a rhetoric of incitement is unacceptable uh, and is not befitting a NATO member, a member of the Council of Europe and an, a candidate to European Union members, membership. So that's the short term uh, alarming development we should really keep our eyes on. The midterm one is, and let me uh, situate this in a broader context, um, as uh, Elizabeth, I think very succinctly presented, this is part of an overarching Islamist neo-Ottoman project. It's irredentist, it's belligerent, it's xenophobic, it's anti-Christian, it's anti-Semitic, and it is looking for new uh, clashes. It's looking for new battlefields from uh, Cyprus to the Aegean, to Libya, to Syria, uh, to you know, Southeastern Europe. Uh, I think that's also what we should be really paying close attention to. Erdogan is likely to escalate Hagia Sophia, he's looking uh, at the reaction coming from Greece, you know, from uh, Orthodox Christian world, from international organizations, uh, always as an opportunity to escalate the crisis. So the next, I, I think it's important to point out to our interlocutors that, because sometimes people do not care, although they need to care about Hagia Sophia or religious freedom issues. But I think it's important to emphasize that this is part of a continuum. And Hagia Sophia is also part of a series of risks that involve security risk, that involve um, uh, US uh, guarantees for other treaty allies, uh, for other partners uh, in the Middle East, North Africa, and Eastern Mediterranean. It's about stability and safety of you know, uh, the transatlantic world uh, and its values. So I think this short-term incitement perspective and this mid-term um, kind of belligerent uh, escalation perspective are both important to watch, but also important to articulate in this manner so more people at the State Department, at Pentagon, uh, at the White House, uh, at the Congress, and you know the global community begin to lend an ear so that we're not just talking to, let's say, we're not just preaching to the choir, but we reach an audience beyond that to push back. Uh, thank you, um, uh, Dr. Demir. I think uh, <laughs> You put that very eloquently, showing how Hagia Sophia is not the, the reconversion of Hagia Sophia is not just about the use of a building, uh, but has numerous layers. Um, and I, I want to kind of pivot to you, um, and the you mentioned Prime Minister uh, Mitsotakis as being one of those international voices that has uh, spoken. Uh, loudly about um, what this means, um, not only for Greece, and, 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 but also for the EU. Uh, there are some people out there who would like to view Hagia Sophia and other issues um, related to our ecumenical patriarchate and, and frame them as Greece-Turkey matters. Um, and I, I think that there, there's a reason why some want to do that. Um, but could you help us understand um, how can you place Hagia Sophia in the broader, you know, geopolitical uh, context? You know, what is the, what is going on um, beyond, let's say, the, the conflict or disagreements between Greece and Turkey? Sure. And 
you know, even they're not, first of all, Hagia Sophia is not a Greece Turkey matter. Greece has never taught treated it as bilateral. Uh, but Greece has always spoken up and on on the rights of Christian minorities, especially in the greater Middle East. Uh, there's historic ties between Greece and not only the ecumenical patriarchy, but the patriarch in Jerusalem, uh, the patriarch in Alexandria, the patriarch in, in Antioch. And Greece specifically says this is not a bilateral uh, issue. But uh, as both Elizabeth and, and Icon uh, discuss greater ambitions and this language of uh, the right of the sword, uh, it, it does not apply only within Turkey. Uh, Elizabeth is 100% right on that July 24th was chosen for a reason. Uh, Turkey is very open about Treaty of Lausanne. Erdogan has been very open about the Treaty of Lausanne does not apply to us. Uh, we're going to renegotiate it. Uh, they have designs on the Aegean. What what Icon just talked about his expansion to Libya. Uh, he, you know, he, he created a fictional maritime border with Libya that that is premised on the fact that Crete and uh, and Cyprus don't exist. Otherwise, there would there could be no potential border. What we should pay attention to also, so we don't put this in just Greek and Turkish affairs, is the day the two days immediately after a Hagia Sophia decision. Uh, that happened on a Friday. On Saturday, Erdogan declared that he's going to free the Alaska Mosque in Jerusalem. And then, uh, the irony of irony, it would be like, you know, Jeffrey Epstein saying he's worried about the exploitation of women. He, he went to he made a declaration, this genocide denier made a declaration that he'll never let the world forget about the Srebrenica genocide, which I agree, the world should never follow, forget about the Srebrenica genocide, but Erdogan's the wrong spokesperson. So this is part of a, of a strategy that some people identified as early as his re-election in 2011, which I kind of, I may have to rely on you on quoting it directly, but I think he said today is not only a victory in Izmir, but in Sarajevo, not only in Ankara, but Alexandria, not only, his ambitions uh, are, are far beyond uh, Turkey's particular state. And, um, and he's pushing it, right? He's shown, he's shown that he's willing to have, at this point, as of today, three open battlefields. Right? He has Syria, and in Syria, we could say he has multiple open battlefields. He has Libya, which he is conducting, by the way, with drones and with Syrian jihadists. Not with, he's, he's shipping Syrian jihadists over to Libya to fight. And this past week, in combination with Azerbaijan, he opened a battlefield with Armenia. He has declared that he's going to drill in, in Crete by September. And Prime Minister Mitsotakis made it quite clear when he visited President Trump in January that if a, if a Turkish drill ship comes into Crete's waters, it's going to be sunk. So this is, I mean, this is something that's out there. So we're talking about someone who is, who is at least planning for four open battlefields. Uh, and it, it's a dangerous mentality. So the, uh, just to um, maybe uh, recall what uh, Icon said earlier about, you know, uh, Erdogan saying things because he is at his strongest, but also at his weakest. Um, do you think that there's any credibility? Is he just pounding his chest right now saying these things to, again, continue to show that he is strong and willing to say the things to regain political support? Or... Should we really be paying attention, as Elizabeth said earlier? I mean, things are happening, things are being said, and no one's noticing. And I mean, is this, are these, you know, when he mentions all of these different parts of the world, um, should, is this something serious that? Yeah, yeah it's, it's absolutely serious. I mean, and, 
It's gotten more serious lately, and I, ICON has written some great stuff about that. The economic crisis, and almost anywhere in, in, in the region's history, when you have an internal crisis, you create an external crisis. That's one. But also, he, he, I think he underestimated how fast the region was coming together. If someone 10 years ago told you there was going to be a major conference where Egypt and Greece, Israel and Cyprus, the Jordanians, the Italians, the French, and the Palestinians were all going to be together, you would have laughed them out of the room. But that happened, and it's happening over and over again. And France, and the region has come together and told Turkey, and in fact, to be fair, everybody has said Turkey can be part of this, but they have to play by the rules that we're coming up together. They can't make their own rules. Turkey's model, and I believe internally too, and I'd love to hear Icon's uh, point of view of this, is that the Mediterranean is the South China Sea, the Aegean is the East China Sea, and Turkey is China, which it doesn't work. The region's not going to happen. I think he got away with tweaking a lot. Erdogan has been very good coming up to a line where he doesn't provoke sanctions or other military action and not crossing that line. So for example, people may say he's been drilling in Cyprus all the time. Well, not really because he goes in waters where Cyprus hasn't declared, hasn't given licenses. So he hasn't come close to Exxon. He hasn't come close to Noble. He hasn't come close to Total. He seems to only harass the Italians because the Italians are, you know, they, they seem to be scared to fight, but he doesn't bother the French. But in Crete, it would be a whole different situation. And I think, as Icon said before, his internal political and economic standing, so Erdogan in his weakest, is going to make him lash out. We saw this at Evros, right, when he tried to overwhelm the Greek borders. Do not underestimate how important Mitsotakis' resolve was at Evros, because there will be a point where he tries to overwhelm uh, Europe's borders again. Um, I want to. I want us to kind of shift a little bit. We we spoke much about uh, geopolitics, and we can continue speaking about geopolitics. But I, I, I want us to understand a little bit more. If you can help us, uh, Elizabeth, understand the importance of religious freedom. Um, and looking back, remembering. Oh, sorry, the lights turned off. Trying to be environmentally friendly. <laughs> if. Um, Recalling your time as a commissioner on USERF, the vice chair, um, uh, you know, religious freedom is becoming ever more important in kind of political dialogue. Religion, you've been saying this for years, religion is a uh, significant uh, voice in uh, geopolitics. Um, it's a part of the fabric of society and shouldn't be ignored. Um, what should we expect or what should we be asking from bodies like you, sir, for the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom here in the U.S. and around the world? What should we be um, expecting from them and asking of them? Uh, thank you, Your Eminence. So the, the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, the acronym is USCIRF, U-S-C-I-R-F. Uh, that uh, body, it's an independent government agency that was created in 1998 uh, with probably what was the last unanimous bipartisan decision of the United States Congress, namely the passage of the International Religious Freedom Act. And it created that body, um, as well as the Office of International Religious Freedom at the State Department, and also an advisor on religious freedom on the U.S. National Security Council. Interestingly enough, it's only in the last four months that, for the first time, that NSC position was, was filled. But I served from 2004 to 2012 on the commission. And I would urge, I, I think all American citizens should ask of you, sir, if what I, I urged at the time and continue to urge. And that's let your yes be yes and your no be no, and there's no room for lukewarm. Um, and by that, I mean simply that the USERF has the beauty of being independent. It's not part of the State Department. It's not part of the executive branch. 
but it speaks to all of those and it's required to speak to Congress. Um, and so I would suggest that uh, the USERF should have, as we did in 2012, designate Turkey a, a country of particular concern for its, you know, uh, empirically evident, um, systematic and egregious violations of religious freedom. And again, you know, the, the Christian minorities and the ecumenical patriarchate in particular are simply an emblem of a broader situation in Turkey. For all of the countries, you know, uh, small non-Muslim minorities, Jews, Christians, every kind of Christian, but also for the country's sizable Alawite minority, which are considered by some Sunnis as non-conforming Muslims, and therefore they're subject to their own um, you know, kind of discrimination. So this issue of Hagia Sophia and how the, the USERF responds by designating it a CPC would have signaled to Turkey and to all of Turkish citizen, citizenry that the United States is willing to take a, um, at least a symbolic stand. And that can still happen. Uh, the USERF can uh, designate out of the, the standard designation period, CPC, and the State Department's IRF office, International Religious Freedom Office, can also do the same. And I would also urge that, you know, um, that, you know, a body like the USERF realize that there's an intrinsic relationship between freedom of conscience, belief, and religion on the one hand, or more broadly human rights, and on the other hand, security. In Washington, those kinds of functions and policies tend to be siloed. Uh, the human rights, religious freedom, people only talk to each other, and the security people only talk to each other. But we know from all over the world that you cannot have protections for religious freedom and human rights if you don't have a stable security environment. And you can't have a stable security environment, especially human security, if there are not protections for freedom of conscience, belief, and religion. And that means the right to believe, means the right to change your belief, it means the right freedom of speech to express your relief. It means a freedom of assembly. So we need to, you know, I would urge um, people to encourage the USERF and all of our government agencies that work on religious freedom to not separate out human rights from broader foreign policy, but to see them all intrinsically related. And then finally, one last footnote, I would say that there's a whole toolbox at the disposal of the USERF when it comes to protecting and promoting religious freedom. Some of that toolbox includes heritage diplomacy, cultural diplomacy, support for preservation of cultural and religious sites, citizen to citizen diplomacy. I can, you have, you know, led so many of those efforts when you were an elected, when you, you know, when you were an MP in Turkey and since then. Um, those are things that are in the toolbox that can encourage conversation, dialogue, and a recognition of what we've been saying, universality. Um, and then there are the harder sort of toolbox uh, mechanisms, which are sanctions, which the USERF applied um, in 2018 when Pastor Andrew Brunson uh, was, had been in prison for almost two years. Um, and there are other things at, at the disposal, um, harsher diplomatic tools or policy tools um, at their disposal. But a whole of government approach, human rights, religious freedom, part of security and vice versa, and hold um, those agencies accountable. And a, a, a positive outcome on the Hagia Sophia, um, although the horse has left the barn, there's still room for you know, leading it in a different direction. A positive outcome on Hagia Sophia, I think means the difference between the survival of the ecumenical patriarchate in Turkey and what's left for of the, um, the Greek Orthodox community. It is a signal for the other vulnerable communities there. And it's also a signal to all of those in Turkey who don't support this decision and would see, would prefer to see Hagia Sophia either remain a mosque, I mean, a, a museum, excuse me, or at least be a cultural heritage site with full access to anyone, regardless of where they figure in the religious ecosystem. Well, and, and uh, we'll speak a little later. My, my last question to the group is kind of more practical, and we'll come back to some of the recommendations you made, Elizabeth, in terms of what to ask and how to keep these organizations accountable. Um, uh, Icon, 
your your program at the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, FDD, has analyzed several points of policy conflict between the U.S. and Turkey, um, including the treatment of religious minorities. What what could we have realistically expected um, that the U.S. could have done or could still do um, to prevent uh, what happened, but also you know, looking forward to kind of what what Elizabeth just mentioned in her closing remarks about the the survival of the future of the ecumenical patriarchate. I think it's important to realize that not only U.S. can do a lot, but that the U.S. has failed to do a lot. I think that's a key take-home message. That mm. if we see Agia Sophia as a battle lost today, the battle was not lost today. The battle was lost elsewhere and a while ago. And I call that process the process of appeasement. And uh, it's not just about the current administration. It started with the previous administration or the one before that. But basically what we see with Erdogan is, especially within the last decade, a, a successive, successive steps of appeasement that is, uh, the United States looking, looking the other way as Erdogan acted not like a, you know, bona fide uh, ally, treaty ally, but as an adversary. And just to give you a, a couple of concrete examples, and these are very important, I think, rays with policymakers, analysts, and journalists in the US. So the issue is situated in, in a broader context, that is, this is not just a one-off erratic behavior by Erdogan, but this is the last step of a series of adversarial behavior from an ally that has gone rogue. Um, just to give you one example, I'm sure you all heard about the, 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 the story of Pastor Andrew Brunson, the North Carolina pastor who spent two years in a Turkish prison on ludicrous charges of being a spy, you know, a terrorist and a coup plotter. Now, back in June 2018, together with the former U.S. ambassador to Turkey, Ambassador Eric Edelman, I co-authored a report, an FTD monograph, titled Erdogan's Hostage Diplomacy. You know, because we believe it was important to reframe this whole debate. You know, Erdogan, is not a, no longer a NATO ally. He is borrowing from Tehran's playbook of hostage diplomacy, and we documented more than 50 Western nationals and residents who were held on ludicrous charges, including Greek soldiers, as bargaining ploys, as, as bargaining chips. And to be frank, uh, the US failed to push back. There was you know, a very short uh, sanction, a global Magnitsky sanction, which then led to the release of Pastor Brunson, but it was then immediately taken back. And then there were three employees of the State Department, you know, Turkish employees of the U.S. State Department, who were basically left rotting in prison in Turkey. So that's one important opportunity where the U.S. failed to push back. The other one is, as Andy said, the S-400. You know, this here is a NATO ally purchasing a sanctioned Russian air defense system and basically the U.S. looking the other way rather than imposing Katza sanctions. You know, this is legally mandated sanctions. The, the third issue, uh, you might have heard about Halk Bank, you know, Turkey's second largest public bank and its key role, Turkish government sanctioned role in evading U.S. sanctions against Iran. For those of you who didn't follow the story, this is the biggest sanctions evasion scheme in the history of U.S. sanctions. More than $20 billion of assets were basically provided to Iran at the height of U.S. sanctions. This is, again, a bipartisan issue. You know, it started during the Obama years, continued into the Trump years, and basically successive U.S. administrations looked the other way. And uh, although ultimately the court, you know, convicted the deputy CEO of the Turkish bank, 
uh, to 32 months in prison. Still, the bank is not sanctioned. Um, still, you know, uh, the U.S. treats Erdogan and, you know, his public lender leniently as they continue to play the U.S. legal system and being, to some extent, sheltered uh, by the U.S. administration. So I think it's very important to hit these points to convey to U.S. policymakers that the battle for Hagia Sophia was lost long before and as long as U.S. continues to, and the EU continues to, and NATO continues to appease Erdogan, uh, such uh, rogue state action, such rogue state behavior will continue. And hence, Erdogan's Turkey will continue to fly Syrian jihadists to Libya, will continue to weaponize 3.6 million Syrian refugees, by, as Erdogan said, quote unquote, I will bust them to the European border. So all of these are a pattern and it's important to push back at every step of his belligerent action so that he does not dare do this. So, you know, again, my better health tuba published an op-ed in December, 2013 in a Turkish, in, a, in an English daily published in Turkey. And it was titled Hagia Sophia's precarious future. Mm. So that's six and a half years ago. So, you know, um, we came here um, through numerous steps not taken, through numerous steps to appease Erdogan. Uh, and if you want to reverse, if, if you want to say whatever little remains of Hagia Sophia, because although I use the term that we lost the battle, there are still many battles to be won around Hagia Sophia. You know, uh, the preservation of its cultural heritage. You know, uh, you know, Elizabeth referred to the, the Trabzon Hagia Sophia, the Nicaea one and the Edirne one. You know, uh, they were all to some extent destroyed, meaning their conversion to a mosque entailed horrible destruction of sacred heritage. You know, they did a horrible job. Uh, there. And this can be repeated with Hagia Sophia. I know Erdogan feels the, sees the limelight, he will be very careful, but there are no guarantees that this will not be a botched job again. So we still have battles to win, meaning in terms of pushing back, but let's make sure we situate it into a coherent and comprehensive framework that if we don't push back against hostage diplomacy, if we don't push back against S-400s, if we don't push back against weaponization of refugees and belligerent action in the Eastern Med, then we won't be able to push back against Hagia Sophia. So I think that's the, the, the key strategy. Uh, and that, of course, entails uh, allies, meaning I think uh, the Orthodox Christian world as well as you know, uh, the, United, the, the, the Greek Orthodox community in the US needs to work with other allies who care about these broader issues, whether it's hostage taking or uh, you know, um, energy projects and uh, the S-400s and Russia sanctions and Libya, uh, Jerusalem and Al-Aqsa Mosque. That this shows the importance of uh, building alliances. And let me end with, the most important alliance that we rarely think of. Where are our allies in Turkey? You know, they, I know they're silent, they're scared, they're imprisoned, they're in exile like me, uh, but don't despair. Meaning when you see a country of 84 million and when you see very few individuals able to speak against Erdogan, don't see Turkey as a lost cause because this is the same Turkey that defeated Erdogan last year at the municipal elections. So there, those individuals in Turkey are just looking for an opportunity to reverse all this. But they need allies. They need solidarity. And they also need courageous action from the US, from the EU, uh, from NATO, because if they see that coming, they will 
join uh, what I call this push for democracy and pluralism and secularism in Turkey. But if they see everyone appeasing Erdogan, uh, they will also be in the same defeatist mentality. So make sure, I know it's not easy, but make sure at least to think about what allies can we find among Turks and Kurds and others in Turkey and what other allies can we find in the diaspora, you know, in Europe and in the United States? Who are those few Turkish citizens who are willing to put their lives and passports and properties at risk? Just like I did and Tuba did, we lost it all. We would do it again because this is a moral calling. We're just doing the right thing. But we're not the only ones. There are others who are just looking for a, 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 a hand that reaches out to them. So make sure uh, you also spend some time finding those allies, nurturing them, working with them, and demonstrating your solidarity as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I Can I make a point on that? Your eminence just because. Yeah, sure. go, go ahead. You know, it is. Icon did go in exile, and and this is this is his story. Something that all our uh, all our people should understand because it was. It's not like okay, I'm in exile. I'm okay. I'm like Niki Sodarakis in exile or Venizelos in exile. His his passport was canceled. His assets were seized. His wife lost her job. Um, they're they're effectively stuck as a family in the United States. And he, I know for a fact that the, the security threats he, he gets at FDD, but he still speaks up. There's a difference with what ICON suggested and what has happened in the past in the United States and even in our own community. You don't just find somebody who is in Turkey who may be in power and think that, okay, that you gotta, we have to, we have to invest in the courageous voices because Erdogan never got, what was the highest vote total he ever got percentage-wise, Icon? Now with the presidential alliances, 52%. But that was with the alliances. Yes, with the alliance. As a single party, he never got 50%. Never, not once. But the more we reward and appease, especially his present coalition, which is all nationalist, we're going to force the opposition to say, then we got to be a little more nationalist too. And that will have long-term ramifications for the patriarch, for other Hagia Sophia issues, for the Aegean and all the rest. The, it's, not, it's not a hard thing to find people who have been exiled and, and to stick up for them. Because you know, it, when, when democracy goes in Turkey, we will forever in Greece, in the United States, in Cyprus, pay the consequence for it. But we have to back real Democrats with a small d, real pe people who are really into religious pluralism and not the people who happen to be in power and say the right things. Well, I, I, um, I was gonna ask all, all three of you a, a question before turning over to um, the participants' questions. But Icon and Andy, you, you kind of answered the question I was going to ask. I'm going to turn this over to just Elizabeth, if that's okay. Um, and and again, if if we need to, we can always you can always chime in. But Elizabeth, um, so we're in Chicago, or the Midwest uh, metropolis of Chicago, in our little corner of the universe here. Um, we're concerned about what's going on um, in Turkey. We're saddened by what has happened to Hagia Sophia. And we're very concerned about our ecumenical patriarchy. Um, what can we do, I mean, practically? I know you mentioned, you know, keeping the um, usurps of the world accountable and insisting that they, they do what they're meant to do, right? What they're, what, why they were created. Um, but what can we do and how do we kind of, where, how do we start? How do we, how do we not just talk about it, but you know, what steps can we take as, you know, the faithful of the metropolis of Chicago 
to um, respond to the issue of Hagia Sophia, but I think, you know, more importantly, long-term, the, uh, the well-being uh, of our ecumenical patriarchate and the religious freedom of the ecumenical patriarchate. I think, you know, there are multiple things. Number one is read and learn history, um, because this is all about history. Um, it's about the past and it's about using the past for the present and the future. And so I think, you know, it may sound very simplistic, but um, I think it's important to hold uh, ourselves as Orthodox Christians accountable and learn our own history um, and not just pay attention at moments of crisis. Um, so I, I would urge that. Um, and I would also urge that, um, you know, we, I would urge also that we are very attentive to language, and I will go back to something that Icon and, and Andy have said. I think it would be a, a, a very serious mistake to think that the solution to what's happening in Turkey is to have Erdogan leave office. Because, you know, secularism in Turkey under, I mean, we, we all would read this, in the new, anyone, an American citizen would read, Turkey is a NATO ally, a secular democracy. Secularism in Turkey never meant equality before the law. And Icon, you and Tuba are here, you're brave and courageous, and your work in Turkey as a parliamentarian on behalf of freedom of conscience, religion, and belief, I think highlighted this fact that secularism, you know, in, in the Turkish version, and in many other versions around the world, has never meant equality before the state. I mean, Turkish citizens, Archbishop Iakovos himself said, I marched with Martin Luther King because I understood it, what, what it was like to be a slave, okay? I understood what it was like to be a second-class citizen. So secularism in Turkey, going back isn't the solution. And I think that's what's so courageous about what you did, Icon, and continue to do, is to emphasize that, you know, separate and unequal is bad, certainly for you know, religious minorities, but bad for all citizens of Turkey. Um, so I, I think we should never fall into the trap of thinking that going backward is somehow the solution or just getting, you know, hoping that Erdogan is not reelected. So I, I, again, that means reading history and paying attention to language. The other thing I would say is we live in a democracy and um, people want to get elected. So uh, make sure that your, your vote counts. Um, that's what elected officials care about and recognize that, you know, the mistakes that ICON has spoken about and ND has outlined in terms of, you know, what ICON called appeasement, those are not restricted to any one party. When President Obama went to Turkey, his first trip outside the U.S., uh, I remember, you know, he, he refused to meet with the ecumenical patriarchate at the patriarchate. And that's because the Turkish government pushed back hard. And I know that because on the commission, we wrote a letter to the White House asking for him to go there. He didn't. Now, under this administration, um, you know, sanctions were imposed for Pastor Brunson for three months. August 2018, November 2018, Pastor Brunson comes home, the sanctions are lifted. What's the message? Okay, it's all about one Protestant pastor who cares about everyone else, including every Turkish citizen. So, you know, both sides of the aisle have made their mistakes when it comes to what ICON um, and, and, and Andy are talking about. So I think, you know, we need to think strategically and uh, ask whatever administration is elected to make sure that human rights and security are understood as two sides of the same coin and let your vote count. That's the beauty of a democracy that you know, people running for election who want your vote need to listen to the things that are important to you. And then one last thing, uh, I would urge that um, under discussion, uh, uh, um, a proposed memorandum of understanding on cultural heritage between Turkey and the United States, uh, that proposal would um, allow Turkey to designate as its own cultural heritage all artifacts, sites, intangible heritage uh, from the Paleolithic era, 12,000 years ago, up to 1923. And that will have catastrophic um, implications for um, 
the fullness of Turkey's cultural heritage. It's multi-ethnic, multi-religious um, cultural heritage. So I would urge that, you know, you let your, um, you know, your congressional officials know that that's not a, an agreement that um, should be signed. Wow. <laughs> well, you ask me, I don't know. Yeah. That's, that's a one word response to all of that. I mean, it's one word response to what all three of you have offered um, tonight. Um, I think I've, I've learned quite a bit. I'm sure our, our people who are following are, are learning and we'll, you know, I think it's, this is a wake up call for us to um, understand that um, I, I think my, my, my key takeaway tonight is that, you know, we're, we're all in this together, that there are people who are uh, brave, putting their lives on the line for, for important issues like democracy, religious freedom, that we even here in Chicago have to, um, we, 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 we need to participate in that uncomfortableness uh, that others are experiencing. Um, you know, they're experiencing persecution. You know, it's okay for us to have conversations and write letters and do the, the things that may seem, uh, that may make us uh, uncomfortable here. Um, I, I want to turn this over now to the, the floor. Uh, we received a few questions. Um, one of them was, what can we do as Orthodox Christians here in Chicago? So I asked that already. Um, there are a few that have come in and I'd ask if we can, you know, one at a time, unmute some of the individuals. Um, there's, there's a question from uh, Gus Publicus. I don't know if he's still on. Uh, Gus is the, one of the regional co-commanders of our archons. Gus, um, would you like to ask your question? Yes, thank you, Your Eminence. I'm really happy and glad that we have Dr. Pedromo and Dr. Icon and Andy on our side. Uh, really great minds. Uh, quickly, the questions are this, that um, with the European Union now condemning Turkey's decision, what impact will this have on Turkey's ability to gain access to the European Union? And do they really care? And can uh, the decision really backfire against the Turkish government in the world arena? So, so... Turkey was are not. You, Gus, are you asking that uh, of any one panelist so that we don't get all three answering this so we can get some other? So, uh, of the three panelists, who wants to take this one? Why don't we do it that way so I can uh, pin, pin me the person who's going to answer? So, since I'm dealing with the European Commission right now, I guess I'll take it. <laughs> but uh, Turkey's EU ship sailed a while ago and probably. The death knell of it was the migrant crisis, right? But I think it sailed even before that, but that was certainly the death knell uh, of it. There is no, at best, at best, and I think even inside Turkey, they talk about at best, they're gonna get a customs union, which they have plus, like a special trading relationship is the highest that they're gonna uh, aim for. Uh, I do think it's going to backfire because I think people got sick of, and this goes back to Icon's appeasement, and in Europe specifically, they got sick of the carrot stick only. Everybody was, give a carrot, give another carrot, give another carrot, give another carrot. Somebody has figured out to use a stick. There's a discussion that we've had long ago, especially in Cyprus, and for the first time this last week, Greece has raised it, that Greece may invoke Article 42 of the uh, of the Treaty of Rome of, for the European Union, which is in effect the Article 5 that NATO has, a common defense. Uh, Greece is talking about crippling sanctions. Uh, Cyprus is talking about trying to veto any extension of, of Turkey's customs union, right? And remember, the EU is Turkey's number one trade partner. So I think you're gonna, you're definitely gonna see a, a mix uh, of carrots and sticks, probably in the short term, more towards the sticks. Con going to Elizabeth's point, outside of the administration, whoever's president, Congress proved the last two years that they can force policy on Turkey, right? You know, they passed the sanctions on Turkey. The administration is avoiding using them 
and the Republican chair, not a Democrat, Chairman Risch introduced an amendment to the National Defense Authorization Act that will give President Trump 30 days to actually impose sanctions. So let, let's get Congress a little more aggressive, but I think the EU, the EU ship has sailed for Turkey in terms of full membership. It's not a chance, at least not under Erdogan. Thank you, Andy. Uh, there's another question by Lori Champis, and I think that, that I think that we could direct that to Dr. Provaromo since she mentioned it earlier. She hinted at this. Lori, are you still on? Yes, I'm here. Uh, go ahead. So I guess mine it, it starts with a comment. So our Greek community is mourning twice today, um, once for the 46th year anniversary of. Turkey's illegal invasion of Cyprus. And now the loss of Christians, the most holy site, Hagia Sophia, conversion into a ma mosque. So my question is, what role do you feel that the Turkish invasion of Cyprus has had and continues to have in our Greek Orthodox faith and the Greek community? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I would also let people know that um, ICON was a member of the Turkey EU Interparliamentary Committee, if I'm not um, mistaken, and you worked on the early part of the harmonization and convergence between Turkey and the EU when there was significant progress. But so field more questions to him by email about Turkey and the EU um, to follow up on what Andy offered as well. Uh, regarding Cyprus, uh, you know, I, I'll, I'll speak very candidly. Um, I, I think, sadly enough, that um, uh, so I have a Cypriot mother and an Arcadian, a Cypriot father, an Arcadian mother, and a Castorian husband. So all over the place in, in, you know, in, the, in the Greek space. Um, my, my simple um, sense is that for the most part, um, Orthodox Christians in America and Greek Orthodox Christians in America um, don't really think much about Cyprus and occupied Cyprus. If you've been to, uh, you know, I was fortunate to go when we went as you know, with my, my parents to Cyprus when it was, you know, there was no division. And then I've been uh, twice to occupied Cyprus, many times back to Cyprus, but twice to occupied Cyprus. And I would urge people to go to occupied Cyprus um, for a lot of reasons. First of all, um, the condition of the Turkish Cypriots there is, is very unfree vis-a-vis -vis the Turkish occupation regime. But also more broadly, um, the absolute um, human tragedy and utter disgrace um, that has been perpetrated in occupied Cyprus, where over 550 uh, Greek, Armenian, and Maronite churches have been desecrated. They have been and destroyed. They have been turned into um, public toilets. They've been turned into stables for animals. They've been turned into military pillboxes. They've been turned into casinos. They've been turned into hotels. Um, it's absolute, It's a human tragedy of monumental proportions and the loss of what we've been talking about, not only, you know, Cypriot heritage, but Cypriot heritage writ large, but world heritage is unrecoverable um, because so much has been destroyed. And I say this because, I, sadly enough, and it pains me to say it, but I will say it again. I think for the most part, there's not a lot of thought about what's happening in Cyprus, other than in this, again, sort of standard media phrase, you know, uh, solution to the Cyprus problem. And I, I, I say this because if more people saw what had happened to cultural and religious heritage in the northern part of the island, then people would understand what can happen in other parts of the world. And that goes beyond Greek and Turkish, Turkish Orthodox, you know, Christian Muslim issues. This is a universal problem, okay? And we're talking about cultural and religious heritage as something that's a gift to the world. So whether we're talking about, you know, Buddhist statues, you know, in, in Afghanistan, or whether we're talking about what's happened in Yemen, in the war there, I mean, these are issues that we must all care about. And if we want people to care about things that we're talking about, we need to do what I kind of end you're saying too. We need to care about others. Um, and that's how you form alliances. And that's how you, you share. And it's also how you learn to speak the truth about sometimes very, very uncomfortable things. So 
Um, I would urge you to go to Cyprus and I would urge you to cross the green line because the eyes don't lie. Um, and it'll mean that when we come back to the US as well, we'll see our own discussions in this country from you know all sorts of vantage points. You know, and again, for minorities, majorities, but how to share. And I think that's what, you know, we, we would all want, uh, how to treat people with human dignity and respect um, and that we seek and we would offer it to others. So go to Cyprus, cross the green line and see with your eyes. So your eminence, I want to add to that because today's a 46th anniversary of me being expelled from my home because I was 18 months old in Cyprus there. And what I'm going to meld Elizabeth and Icon's uh, comments about making allies. Maybe the most famed story of one of our allies for Cyprus, for Greece and the Orthodox world is Senator Menendez. And it started by him taking a constituent to his hometown in Morfu and seeing what happened in the churches there. Seeing that the church where his constituent, Tasso Zambas, was baptized in, was turned into a stable. Uh, recently, one of ICON's, just I think last year or the year before, one of ICON's uh, colleagues, John Shanzer, went and was stunned and he was tweeting about the barbed wire and the checkpoints. This is a European capital covered with barbed wire. You can go or you can also go to the, the municipality of Famagusta, of Varosha, and sit over a hill and look at a, a city that was once the Miami of the Mediterranean, where Elizabeth Taylor was summering every summer, where 63% of Cyprus's hotel beds are, and now it's a ghost city. I thought you were going to say where I was summering, Andy, but that's, that's okay. Right. okay. Uh, but I, I think it is also important, back to Icon's point, and, and Elizabeth, my father grew up in a village called Komi Kepir. It was one of the only villages that its original name was Turkish. It was a mixed village. He never felt, he, you know, I remember when, when the internet came up and he was excited, he was finding Turkish super friends on the internet to play Davli with, because that's how they grew up, right? But now they're changing the demographics. Turkish Cypriots have fled Turkey. And if you go to London and you'll see Turkish Cypriots and Greek Cypriots in London sitting next to each other, but you can't, you can't even imagine that in Cyprus because there's more settlers. When Bulgarians got kicked out of, Bul when Bulgarian Turks got kicked out of Bulgaria, Erdogan settled them in, you know, in, in Cyprus. So, you know, there's reports of Syrians coming in. We don't know. They don't allow, they don't allow censuses there. But this, there is no greater example 46 years of appeasement, 46 years. And we're left begging to see if maybe there's a 10 year timetable for Turkish, 40,000 Turkish troops. NATO's second biggest army is, is occupying a country that probably has less firepower than we've seen some of from our police departments in, in the United States. That appeasement as Icon said, we lost Hagia Sophia long ago. When, when Elizabeth was on USERF, she could tell you the fight she had to get to get uh, in the Turkey chapter, what Erdogan's Turkey was doing to Christianity in, in Cyprus, which was, the, which was that country, if I must remind everybody, of the first Christian mission. Uh, but there we are. Well, Andy, I know that uh, the Cyprus, uh, Cyprus is a, a very personal issue for obvious reasons. Um, and our hearts and prayers are, go out to those who lost their lives and their loved ones who um, um, are still mourning them. Um, we have one more question that we can maybe take uh, Robert from Robert Mueller. Um, is Robert still on? Can you un uh, unmute Robert? Yeah. Hey, Robert. Uh, and I think the, you know this question I think it could be directed um, to um, Icon, if that's okay. Yes, yes. Go ahead, Robert. Hello, Your Eminence. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, just a, a second on Cyprus. We, our family visited uh, 
a dozen years ago and uh, both sides. And we did go out of our way with a very scared taxi driver. Um, I just lost everybody. We can see you and hear you, Robert. Okay. Um, with a very scared taxi driver to try to locate a church. And in fact, that church was, you know, not even really on the map. We finally found it. And uh, just as Andy or Elizabeth said, uh, you know, it was disgusting. It was, uh, it was ransacked. It was, uh, there were animals. I mean, just farm animals. Um, I don't know if they were in it, but you could tell they were, uh, you know, destroying it. So, just remarkable. And then we opened up our tour book uh, and we found the same church in the tour book and the tour book was describing it to be a wonderful place and in such great condition. And it looks so wonderful in the picture. And that's what they were selling to tourists. It was pretty disgusting. Um, uh, so the question that I had related to um, um, more so if, if the economy of Turkey is as troubled as it really is, and you can tell it is through metrics uh, in the markets and um, uh, currency values and uh, uh, quite a bit. And, and so I do think that they are essentially bankrupt. Uh, inflation is just being uh, masked. And, and, uh, and we know countries that have this type of position uh, the leaders can the leaders can fake it for a while, but most of the citizens, many of the citizens, really know better. Uh, and and the promises uh, with such a long administration, uh, the promises don't seem that valid anymore. Uh, so the steps become more radical in order to keep the same beliefs or the same the same enthusiasm. My question is, uh, don't you know? Internationally, don't countries influence alternative uh, candidates to come into play uh, by, you know, helping them in a big way and uh, supporting them directly, indirectly, known, unknown? And aren't there candidates that would, uh, that could, in fact, be more embraced more realistically? Because at the end of the day, I'm not sure if all the Turkish citizens have the, the the extremists, the nationalist beliefs that the leader is trying to project. I think, I think the key issue here is um, not to tilt an unlevel playing field even further toward Erdogan. Because I do remember the photo up, you know, German Chancellor Angela Merkel provided Erdogan in the run up to one of his challenging elections. And, you know, we were basically tearing our hairs out. We were thinking, what does she think she's doing? You know, why is she granting Erdogan legitimacy just weeks before an election? So I think the key issue is that, again, in the months and years to come, there will be these key moments when the US and the EU should not tilt the playing field to Erdogan's advantage. Now, you might be wondering how. Uh, for Erdogan, who needs an urgent lifeline, a financial lifeline, uh, there is one clear uh, source of funding, and that is the International Monetary Fund, the IMF. Now, you know, you might have followed the Argentinian bailout, which was a $50 billion bailout, and Erdogan's Turkey needs 100 to $150 billion. This would be the biggest bailout in the history of the Bretton Woods institutions. Now, I think it's very important, you know, for American citizens to let their legislators know that, their representatives know that, since the uh, US is the largest shareholder in the Bretton Woods institutions, that there should not be a free pass to Erdogan because IMF bailouts come with strings attached. These conditionalities could be on the lighter end or they could be on the heavier end. And the biggest mistake would be to grant Erdogan, you know, this bailout package with no strings attached. 
because that would be given him a, that would be akin to given, giving him a carte blanche. That would be telling him, you know what, here is $150 billion for your military adventures, you know, from the Eastern Mediterranean to Libya, for your conversion attempts from one Hagia Sophia to the other, or for your weaponization of refugees, you know, from the Syrian border to the, the Greek and Bulgarian border. So one key, uh, I think, um, step to be taken, if and when that time comes, is making sure the IMF does not give him a free pass. And there is another danger, and that is Erdogan is not a big fan of the IMF because of the potential for conditionalities. Hence, he has been never endingly sending his representatives to the White House because he wants a swap line with the US Federal Reserve. You know, a swap line is basically an agreement, you know, to exchange uh, Turkish liras from the Turkish Central Bank with, uh, with US dollars from uh, the Federal Reserve. So that's again, a, a free pass, a lifeline to the Erdogan regime. And uh, the last thing the US administration should do uh, is to put pressure on the Federal Reserve to grant Turkey a swap line, similar to what the Qatari Central Bank did, similar to what the Chinese did. But you know, the United States is neither China nor Qatar and should refrain from offering uh, Turkey a lifeline through a, a Federal Reserve swap line. So my key message is often the best support the world community can do is not to tilt the playing field any further because that has been the one big debilitating uh, factor. That is neither in Turkey nor globally for Turkey's opposition, which is not perfect, but better than Erdogan, has the playing field been uh, level. And uh, as long as appeasement of Erdogan continues economically, politically, diplomatically, militarily, uh, we, we're making it very difficult for an, a, an embattled opposition to win elections, but they do have potential, so don't despair. Just look at last year's municipal elections. Turkey's opposition bloc won half, is, now runs half of Turkey's population and two thirds of Turkey's GDP. So that shows that uh, Turkey is under Erdogan's yoke, but they want to change it. Uh, they want also freedoms and prosperity for themselves. Well, thank you. Um, everyone, I, I, before uh, ending our, our briefing this evening, I want to thank our speakers, um, Dr. Erdemir, Dr. Pedrovo, and Mr. Zemanides, uh, for really, I, I would say, open, uh, opening up our eyes and our minds um, and helping us understand, I think, much more fully than we did earlier this today, than uh, the, the, the situation in Turkey, but also specifically what is going on with the USOPA. Um, I, if I can just, you know, share some of my own key takeaways and maybe summarize what we heard. Um, the it's very important for us as Greek Orthodox Christians here in the Midwest to know our history, to read history, to um, understand who we are, how we got to where we are today, um, so that we can better understand the signs around us. So that when, when things are happening around the world, when, when actions and, and words are being used by leaders, uh, whether they're in Turkey or elsewhere in the world, um, that we understand how they impact us and others. Um, it's important for us to forge alliances, um, to really care about the plight of, of others. Very often we as a community talk about our own issues. Uh, you know, our patriarchate, our people, uh, very insular in our approach to these important issues, democracy, pluralism, religious freedom. So it's important for us to really look out there, look at our neighbors, who, who, are, who else is suffering, and how can we uh, lend our support to their causes um, so that they can then become a, a, alliances and also care about our issues. And then lastly, 
um, I think it's important for us to take advantage with the good sense of the word of our democracy to um, make sure that our vote counts, make sure that we keep our elected officials accountable, that we um, speak up when it, when it really matters, um, and to make sure that uh, even though maybe we're, we're not that many, but that our voice is heard, that we do so in a way that um, leads to greater understanding of the issues by our own elected officials, because some, maybe they don't even know about what's going on. So it's our responsibility to share with them um, the, the issues. Uh, and so with that, I wanna thank everyone for their time this evening, for all those who participated and joined us. The video uh, will be made available at some point uh, on our Metropolis website and, and people will be able to um, go back and, and listen carefully to what was offered today. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of the questions, but if anyone has a pressing question that they would like for us to pass on to any of our uh, presenters this evening, I'm happy to do that. Uh, you can email the Metropolis and send us your questions. Uh, again, I wish uh, everyone a blessed evening. And again, thank you to our three presenters. Thank you, Your Eminence. Thank you, Your Eminence. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Icon. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thanks Bye. for having us on. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.